Good morning to you. It is, uh, it's always a blessing when the preacher comes on the video and says he's not preaching and not see people get up and leave after that announcement is made. So thank you for being here today and uh, thank you so much as a church for allowing me to come and, and be a part of this fellowship during my last year at um, Beeson Divinity School. It's a place that has truly blessed me. So thank you for that and for allowing me to share with you this morning. I want to ask you, do you have certain fears in your life? Every one of us have different things that, that we are fearful of. And I'll share a few of those with you right now. One of them is heights. I don't like heights. You know, I'm fine in an airplane, but, but heights kind of worries me. Like, this is a little high for me right here, so I'm going to back up. I don't like heights. Another thing I don't like is spiders. I, I'm afraid of spiders. I don't, I don't know why God created spiders. That'll be one of the first questions I ask him when I get to heaven is, why did you create spiders? Another thing that I'm fearful of are snakes. I don't like a snake. Been against them since Genesis. But I've always heard, and I believe this is true, people may disagree with me, there's only one kind of good snake. It's a dead one. So I might disagree, but those are some things that I'm fearful of. But if you think and reflect on your life, there are some things that you are fearful of. They may be different than somebody else. But we are fearful of things. But studies show that all of us have one thing in common, one thing that we fear in common. Maybe not to the extreme as some others, but in some capacity, we all fear death. We fear dying. We fear um, e either it's us dying or someone close to us that's dying. We fear those, those things to some capacity. And, and I can't help but think that this is the same way that Mary and Martha are feeling at the death of their brother, Lazarus. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open it to John chapter 11 with me. John chapter 11, we're going to be in verses 17 through 27. John chapter 11, verses 17 through 27. Here's what it says. Now when Jesus came... He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now, when we look at this family, we... We get a picture of this family in several places in Scripture. We see this family in Mark chapter 14. And Mary is, is anointing Jesus' feet with expensive perfume. And, and she goes to dry his feet with her hair. But Mary's not there. Or Martha's not there. Lazarus isn't there. We see a picture of this family again in Luke chapter 10. And Martha is there and Mary is there. And Martha is in the kitchen fixing Jesus' dinner while Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet just listening to wisdom. But there's no Lazarus. Now, when we get to John chapter 11, we finally see a full picture of what this family looks like. you got Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, except this time, this picture of this family, this is a hurting family now. It's a hurting family because Lazarus is sick. And we know he's sick because when we look at John chapter 11, the first six verses, it says he's sick five different times. Verse 1, it says he's sick. Verse 2, it says he's sick. Verse 3, it says he's sick. Verse 4, he's sick. Verse 6, he's sick. So we look at that and we know that Lazarus is sick. And Mary and Martha have sent a note, have sent 
a text message, if you will, to Jesus. Right down the road in Jerusalem saying, Lazarus is sick. Expecting him to do something about it. But Jesus says in verse 4 that this illness, it's not an illness that leads to death. It's one that will bring glory to God. Now in verse 6, John wants us to know that Jesus loves this family. He loves this family. Yet he does something very odd. When he hears that Lazarus is sick, he waits two days. He waits two days. I mean, what a way to show someone how much you love and care about them. To, to hear that there's an emergency, yet you wait two days before you do anything. But need I remind you that the words emergency and crisis are not in God's vocabulary. They're not in God's vocabulary, but he does wait two days before he goes anywhere. I mean, this is, this is a Jesus who oftentimes redeems by restraining and delivers by delaying. He redeems by restraining and, and delivers by delaying. I, I don't understand this. I don't, I don't understand. But don't you remember the way that God speaks in Job? God looks at the devil and he says, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, yes, I have, but, but you have him protected. You have him under divine protective custody. And if you remove that hedge from around his life, I promise I'll make him curse you to your face. So in chapter 1 of Job, God speaks. Chapter 2, God speaks. But from chapters 3 to 37, nothing. God doesn't say a word. 35 straight chapters for Job to wait on the Lord to speak. Now in chapter 38, God speaks. Chapter 39, God speaks. 40, 41, and it's not until chapter 42 that God delivers by restoring what was lost to Job. 35 straight chapters waiting on a word from God. How long can you wait? How many chapters can you wait for God to speak? Some of you are in chapter 27. You got 10 more chapters to go. Some of you are in chapter 17. You got 20 more chapters to wait. There are some of you today who are in chapter 37 and you're ready to throw in the towel. You're ready to quit. You're ready to quit on school, quit on your career, quit on your marriage, quit on life. But can I tell you something? Chapter 38 is just around the corner. You just have to wait on him. You have to trust him. It's like that old gospel song says, you can't, or, you can't hurry God, you just have to wait. You have to wait. Trust and give him time no matter how long it takes. For he's a God you can't hurry. You don't have to worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. You just got to trust him. But this makes me go back to my question. Why did Jesus wait to go see Lazarus? Why did he wait? Now, when we get to verse 17, we see that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. So Jesus got the message, waited two days, and by the time he got to Bethany, he had already been in the tomb four days. Why? Well, when you look at Jewish custom and tradition, it's said that when the person, Jewish person dies, uh, well, first off, they go ahead and put him in the grave. They, they don't wait. They don't embalm or mummify like the Egyptians do. They put him in the grave. And then what's interesting is they believe that the soul hangs around the body. And it has an opportunity to be reunited with the body for that body and that person to come back to life. If it doesn't have to happen the first day, it happens the second day. If it doesn't happen the second day, the third. But on the fourth day, to show that the body is dead, the soul comes and it, it looks at the body and there is discoloration. And to show that the body is dead, that soul leaves, and now that person is officially dead. So here is Jesus 
waiting four days, making sure all hope was gone. There was no chance of the soul coming back to the body. He, he didn't want people attributing his raising of Lazarus from the dead to a Jewish superstition. All hope was gone. All hope was gone. So here is Jesus at this point waiting four days. And in doing this, what Jesus has done is set the stage for the greatest miracle he ever performed during his ministry here on this earth. Now remember, he was only two miles, as it says in verse 18, from Bethany. I mean, that's not very far. That's walking from here to Target. I mean, it's a 30, 40 minute walk, tops. He could have gotten there quickly. But Jesus has to give time for death to claim Lazarus. And as we see, people have come to console Mary and Martha. Musicians have come and, and they're playing. And as we get to verse 20, Martha comes out to meet Jesus. And in verse 21, she says, if you would have been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. And that's true. Because every time Jesus was around death, death died. He looked at death and overwhelmed death with himself. I mean, he spoke to Jairus' daughter. He said, my daughter, arise, and she got up. He looked at the widow Nain's son and touched the coffin and said, arise, and he did. Jesus overwhelms death with himself. So he waits four days before he shows up to Bethany. She said, if you would have been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. Verse 22, she says, but even now, whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She knew that, that Jesus had this kind of relationship with God. She knew that if she just asked God, God, heal my son, heal my brother, he would do it. So she knows he's got this kind of relationship with God. And Jesus says in verse 23, your brother will live again. And her response, yes, he'll live in the resurrection and this is a proper understanding of theology um, for the Pharisees. Martha didn't have a, a Sadducee understanding of theology that didn't believe in the resurrection. But Jesus isn't just talking about the hereafter. He's talking about the here and now. He's talking about the here and now. And as my preaching professor, Dr. Smith, says, resurrection is a punctuation that signifies the continuation of an eternal moment right now. Resurrection is the punctuation that signifies the continuation of an eternal moment right now. In other words, having a relationship with Christ, I have resurrection life now, and I will always have resurrection life. I'm saved now, and I will be saved for all of eternity. And Jesus goes on to make one of his seven I am statements in verse 25 where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. See, Martha thought that the resurrection was an event. Rather, Jesus tells her that the resurrection is a person. It's a person. And not only will Jesus be raised in the resurrection that is to come. He is the resurrection now. And out of this resurrection comes life. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he tells us, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So since Jesus is the resurrection and, and that's a person, out of this comes a promise. Look at the end of verse 25 and 26. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's the promise. And what Jesus is saying, for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we are born twice and we die once. Born physically, birth certificate. Born spiritually. But there's a flip side to that. For those who have not placed their hope and trust in Christ, you are born once and you die twice. 
and the physical and the spiritual. You see, death is something that we all fear because death isn't natural. God didn't create us to die. He created us to live. And we mess that up with sin. So he's created us to live. But in Christ, we don't have to face death without hope. There is hope. The resurrection and the life is a promise of hope. There's a hope for me. There's a hope for you. There's a hope for those that we have lost that have gone on to glory. Because what Jesus is saying is, if you live, there's hope. And if you die, guess what? There's still hope. And this promise of hope gives us an opportunity to walk through life with peace. The resurrection and the life is a peace. Look at verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. See, though Martha was broken over the death of her brother, she had a peace because though she was iffy about Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She's iffy. She had a peace because she trusted him. She says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. Let me ask you have you ever experienced a death so close to you that you feel like you can't even continue on in life? I imagine this is how Mary and Martha felt. But in Christ, we have the Spirit living inside of us. That when we walk through unfathomable brokenness, it's that Spirit inside of us that's given us the strength to just breathe, to just take a breath. Soon you'll stand. Then you'll take a step. Then you'll take another step. And before you know it, you'll mount up on wings like eagles. You'll run and not grow weary. You'll walk and not be faint. It's that peace that surpasses all understanding. But if you noticed, I left out a question in verse 26. Jesus had just made this claim, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. And he who believes in me and lives will never die. And he looks at Martha and he says, do you believe this? Do you believe that this is true? Do you believe? And I believe that this isn't just a question for Martha. This is a question for all of us today. As a matter of fact, this is the most important question we can ever answer in our entire lives. Do we believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that this is true? And here's what it comes down to. I graduated from Troy University um, a few years ago, and there was one point on campus, there was a girl who had a table set up. And on the front of that table, there was a poster that said, God's not real, prove me wrong. And I was in ministry at this point, so all my friends are texting me, go talk to her, go talk to her. I had to go to class anyway, so um, I I was going that way. And and as I saw the table, people are just gathered around her, just, just beating her over the head with the Bible, practically. And I just sat down on a bench and I watched for a few minutes. And as class started, people moved off into class, and and I made my way up to her, and she was very nice. She said, you have any questions? I said, yeah, I got three. She said, okay, what are they? I said, do you believe that Jesus was an actual person? Like, yeah, I mean, there was a person named Jesus. Okay. I said, do you believe that this man named Jesus, claimed, I'm not saying you believe it, claimed 
to be the Savior of the world. Well, yeah, that's what he claimed. I said, okay. I said, do you believe this man who claimed to be the Savior of the world was taken, nailed to a cross, placed in a tomb, and three days later, I'm not saying you believe he resurrected, but his body was gone. She said, yeah, I mean, that's evidence to prove that. I said, okay. I said, here's what it comes down to. Either Jesus was who he said he was, the Savior of the world, who upon his death, burial, and resurrection defeated death, sin, and hell forever, or he's the biggest hoax that's ever walked the face of this earth. And for 2,000 years, people are still buying into that same lie. I said, as for me, I'm choosing to believe he was who he said he was, the Savior of the world who saved me from my sin. And my hope and my prayer is that you would just come in faith and believe that Jesus was who he said he was. I'm not saying you're going to have all the answers. But just say, God, I'm going to trust you. And watch the way he reveals himself to you. Then I left. I don't know the after story. The seed was planted. But the question comes down to, are you going to believe this? The most important question you will ever answer in your entire life, do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? John MacArthur, he said this, without the resurrection, Jesus' death becomes the heroic tale of a noble martyr, the pathetic death of a madman, or the execution of a fraud. Pathetic, heroic death of a noble martyr, pathetic death of a madman, or the execution of a fraud. Now, before you start putting your stuff up, can I tell you something real quick? That Sunday morning, in the tomb that they placed Jesus in, the tomb that they rolled a stone in front of. The tomb that was watched by guards was robbed that Sunday morning. No, it, it, it wasn't robbed by the disciples. It wasn't robbed by the soldiers, the Roman soldiers. No, it was robbed by the one in which death has no claim over. It was robbed by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It was robbed by the one that Pilate couldn't kill and the grave couldn't hold. It was robbed. And just as Jesus looked at Lazarus and said, get up out of that grave, Jesus got up out of that grave on Sunday morning with resurrection power in his hand as King of kings and of Lord of lords. And he exchanged his crown of thorns for a crown of glory. And since Jesus did this, he gives us the power to do it as well. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? I pray that you do. Would you bow your heads with me? There are some of you who are here today who have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, I'm not just asking 